Victor Hugo was romanticism personified, with all of the excess of feeling and larger-than-life talent and inspiration required for the part. Poet, dramatist, novelist, historian, philosopher, patriot. Hugo was the spiritual sovereign of the 19th century and of the Romantic movement. His life spanned the century. The youth who wanted to be Chateaubriand or nothing would 60 years later be the old man who inspired the symbolist poet and writer Verlaine as the century approached its close. Today, Victor Hugo is remembered more as the writer of Hunchback of Notre Dame than as the dramatist who brought romanticism to the French stage as well as to the Paris streets. But on that opening night in 1830, when Hugo's play Ernani was first performed, it was as much the starting point of French romanticism as the storming of the Bastille marked the beginnings of the French Revolution. His many years in exile, first on the island of Jersey and then on Guernsey, brought about the Victor Hugo legend far more than had his poems and plays. And when he finally returned to France, the role he played was the poet as hero, a more romantic role than ever he was able to write. Jean Cocteau, looking back, described Hugo as a madman who believed himself to be Victor Hugo but Hugo's real role was to be a poet. He believed that poetry was so important that it should be a part of every aspect of life and that the poet should accept the whole of experience without flinching. His poetry was understood and loved by the masses and was respected by other French poets for its originality, eloquence and technical skill. Reading it now, some of the poetry is very effective. Much of it rolls on with a somewhat hollow majesty. But an echo of the impact that Hugo had on his own times is demonstrated by these lines of Tennyson's. Victor in drama, victor in romance, cloud weaver of phantasmal hopes and fears, French of the French and lord of human tears. By the time Hugo died at 83, the earlier romantic had become a classic. October the 12th, 1822. A young poet, completely unknown, marries his childhood sweetheart. Her name, Adele Fouché. His, Victor Hugo. At the ceremony, Hugo's brother, Eugene, is suddenly struck by madness.
Hugo had become the grand old man of French literature, he was still haunted by that memory. Two years before his marriage, the young poet had written Ode on the Death of the Duc de Berry, a poem which gave little sign of genius. But these were not years which provoked brilliance. The empire finished, the incredible era of Napoleon over, France was purring under the restoration of Louis XVIII. The only prominent figure in this political and cultural desert of France was Chateaubriand. Victor Hugo, at 14, in a prophetic display of arrogance and accuracy, declares that he wants to be Chateaubriand or nothing. On the 25th of February, the venerable hall of the Théâtre Français experienced the most sensational evening in its history. To guarantee the success of his play, Ernani, Hugo planted more than 80 of his fellow romantics in the audience. The leader of this romantic gang was Théophile Gautier, a talented young poet and critic. For the occasion, he wore a provocative red vest. It wasn't a red vest. It was pink. That's very important. The play, written with every intention of insulting the aristocracy and infuriating the middle classes, was a smash hit. Not a critical success, it had mixed reviews, but a box office hit. Young artists and young writers loved it. In the Romantic Army, everyone was young. Ernani established Hugo as the leader of the Romantics, a destiny written across his forehead. A face of superhuman power and beauty. It seemed carved out of marble, the forehead and the imagination of a visionary. Who would have suspected that this respectable gentleman was the leader of the wild, long-haired romantics and the terror of the clean-shaven middle class? Fame for Ernani and its author has to compete with other noise and fury. The year 1830 also marks the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The Sphinx, the first French steamboat, is launched. The first railway line between Liverpool and Manchester is inaugurated. The huge increase in newspapers means that news spreads more widely and more freely. The press becomes a political force. Too much of a political force for the reactionary King Charles. On July 25th, he signs four ordinances that suspend the freedom of the press. The press refuses to submit to these orders, provoking the revolution of 1830. But instead of a second republic, the people accept a liberal monarchy headed by Louis Philippe, the citizen king who soon rids himself of the trappings of freedom that brought him to power. The most acute observer of these years, later known as the July Monarchy, is a writer called Honoré de Balzac. In 91 novels, and through more than 2,000 characters, Balzac created his epic Human Comedy, the largest and most faithful picture of the era that witnessed the birth and flowering of the Romantic movement. But Balzac himself was not a true romantic, although he did for the novel what Hugo was doing for poetry, making it freer, more varied, more democratic by using ordinary language and ordinary characters. His novels are rooted in observation rather than the romantic's imagination. Still, he was warmly greeted and admired by Victor Hugo. For the Romantics, the greatest virtue was love. But for Hugo, love was not synonymous with fidelity. His wife, for whom he felt great passion during their secret three-year engagement, soon became disenchanted with Hugo's infidelities and began her own. But Hugo found consolation.
The actress Juliette Drouet entered Hugo's life in 1833. She is a faithful and passionate lover who lives solely for his happiness and patiently tolerates his caprices. Monsieur Victor, come and collect me this evening at Madame K's. Loving you until then will give me patience. Until tonight. Oh, tonight. When I will give myself to you completely. just words following one after another that I put on paper. Ce sont des caresses et des baisers. They are caresses and kisses. Juliette Drouet wrote Hugo more than 15,000 love letters. Letters which show the pitiable Juliet, regarded by her envious generation as the swooning, daring mistress of a sublime bohemian, to be a self-sacrificing supplementary wife. Hugo likes living in the welcome glare of publicity and fame. Juliet Drouet, who gave up her career for him, lives in increasing isolation. Like my body, my soul has desires, but a thousand times more ardent. You give me pleasure, followed by fatigue and shame. I dream of a calm happiness, harmony. I would leave you. I would abandon you. The earth, even life. If I could find a man who caresses my soul, as you love to caress my body. Hugo's rapacious appetite for women was equaled only by his insatiable thirst for fame and glory. He went after both unceremoniously. I know that you are curious and would like to see and know intimately all the women who are interested in your work. So flattering to the poet's pride, to the male ego. J'ai passé toute ma nuit à pleurer. I spend all night in tears. I am still crying this morning. Does it matter if you are happy? After three refusals, Hugo is finally admitted into the Académie Française, pillar of the French literary establishment. Victor Hugo is de l'Académie. Victor Hugo belongs to the Academy. Allons, allons. Good. The Academy needs to be deflowered from time to time. Louis Philippe makes the writer peer of France. Now he is Le Vicomte Hugo. The young rebel who wrote Hernani begins to bulge with respectability. A life secure in love, a life blessed in every social and artistic success. But in a cruel and brutal blow, Hugo becomes an irrevocable companion of tragedy. Leopoldine, his oldest child, 19 and married only a few months, drowns in a boating accident on the Seine. Does one ever recover from the death of a child, especially the favorite, the most loved child? The poet, whose profession is based on feeling, is doubly condemned to live with his sorrow. Hugo never fully recovered from Leopoldine's death. Each year on the anniversary of her death, Hugo writes a poem. Words from the poet's heart of hearts. Poetry out of grief.
When she was a little girl, she would come every morning. I used to wait for her like a ray of sunlight. She would come in and say, Bonjour, mon petit père. The revolutionary mood in France returns. Louis-Philippe is forced to abdicate and a second republic is proclaimed on the 25th of February. One of the fathers of romanticism and a fellow poet, Lamartine, heads the provisional government, ruling France for three months by powerful oratory. That is what the sun saw yesterday, citizens. And what would the sun witness today? It will see another people with fewer enemies to fight, and yet filled with even greater fury. No longer able to trust the same men who only yesterday they raised above them. The same men who now deprive them of their liberty, deny them their dignity, and seek to turn a revolution of unity and fraternity into a revolution of vengeance and torture. The red flag has flown over the Champs de Mars drenched in the blood of the people, 1791. But the flag of France has flown throughout the world, representing the name, the glory, and the liberty of France. Nothing annoys me more than these riots you are always in. I only hope there will be no more revolution, nor devolution. No more myth. I support this government. With that, kiss me and try to attend regularly to the sessions in my bedroom. You are my representative with my unanimous consent. I beg you to carry out your duty regularly and to honor the confidence I have in you. You can see that I am on top of the situation and that the Republicans of yesterday have nothing to teach me. If I so desired, I could teach those of tomorrow, but I do not wish to. I only want you to kiss me to death. That is all. On the day of the proclamation of the Republic, Victor Hugo visits his friend and fellow writer Lamartine at the town hall. You have come to us. This is for the Republic, a proud recruit. My dear friend, we have chosen you to be mayor of your district. Here is the official warrant signed by us. But it is not as mayor I wish you to serve, Hugo but as minister, minister for the public instruction of the Republic. But Victor Hugo does not become a minister. When the elections are held, Lamartine is defeated, and Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor's nephew, is elected president of France. In his newspaper, The Events, Hugo begins to criticize the new ruler. In a famous speech to the Senate, he breaks with the party of law and order and profit. Too many police and not enough justice Anarchy at the top and misery at the bottom. Despotism and repression throughout. France must not be taken by surprise. She must not find herself some bright morning with an emperor without knowing why. Because we had Napoleon the Great, does it mean that we must have Napoleon the Little? An end to parodies. Before we can put an eagle on the flag, we must have an eagle at the Elysee. Where is the eagle? The 
The coup d'etat on the 2nd of December, 1851, confirms Hugo's worst fears. He tries in vain to organize resistance. More than 400 people are killed in the streets of Paris. Both Hugo's sons are put in prison. And the poet, a distinguished member of the Académie Française and a vicomte of France, is wanted by the police. With false papers identifying him as a printer named Lanvin, he flees to Belgium. Thus begins an exile in which France's greatest living poet will spend almost 20 years outside France. After several months living in a modest hotel and writing polemics against Napoleon III, Hugo leaves Belgium for the second stage of his exile on the island of Jersey. There he rents a house called Marine Terrace. Here for two years he is involved in seances with the dead. We are waiting for noises in the deathly voids. We listen to the wind wandering in the darkness where obscurity hovers. And at moments, lost in the mystery of night, we see the window of eternity illuminated by tremendous rays of light. This book a record of the meetings with the dead shall not be published during our lifetimes. We, who have conversations with mysterious beings, although it will surely be one of the Bibles of the future. Hugo believed in the survival of the dead their frequent intervention in the present world and the successive migrations of the soul. Hugo communicated with the dead, first with his beloved Leopoldine and then at seances with Socrates, Christ, Luther, Shakespeare, Byron and Dante. He was not just a dabbler in spiritualism and the occult. He believed that he was a prophet called by God, that the poet must replace the priest as man's guide the poet who must explain the past, civilize the present, and predict the future. The seances came to an end with the sudden madness of one of the participants. For Hugo, madness was a sinister companion. The memory of his brother Eugene, struck by madness on the day of the poet's marriage, haunted him all his life. The situation of a political refugee is hard. He is tolerated, but not adopted. In October 1855, an expulsion order forces Victor Hugo and his family, and of course Madame Drouet, who always lived a discreet distance nearby, to leave Jersey. Madame Hugo begs her husband to live in England, where many Frenchmen are in exile. But Hugo, who doesn't speak English, chooses the neighboring island of Guernsey. If anything, more desolate, more isolated. In Guernsey, Hugo buys a property known as Hauteville House. High on a cliff, with a view of the harbor, on a clear day, the poet can see the shores of France. As a property owner, the refugee cannot be forced to leave the island. Hugo devotes himself to fixing up the house, designing the third floor for himself with a tower for working in. Hugo finds his new surroundings a fertile source of inspiration. More prolific than ever, Hugo is a symbol of resistance to the empire. He is considered one of the foremost intellectual and moral forces of his time. I was told, close this door. Can't you see that anyone, anything could come in? A gust of wind, a woman? 
So I turned towards the person who gave this advice, and I said, Entre. Adele is the youngest of Hugo's children. She has spent her childhood in exile. Instead of friends, she has fantasies. Instead of childhood games, her piano. She is a young woman with a romantic soul. The isolation of exile encourages her romantic delusions. In Jersey, she falls madly in love with a young English officer, Lieutenant Pinson. She becomes obsessed by her desire and longs to marry him. In spite of Hugo's advocacy of a European outlook, he is French and chauvinistic and not at all eager for his daughter to marry an Englishman. Still, the young man is invited to Guernsey for Christmas, 1861. Terrified, no doubt, by the bizarre and eccentric behavior of Adele, an emotional display alien to a young Englishman, Lieutenant Pinson does not respond to the passion he has aroused. The marriage plans fail. What begins as a kind of emotional promiscuity encouraged by isolation and idleness slowly turns into something more serious an irreversible commitment to a life of fantasy. Romantics had a thirst for strong emotions. They praised love and gave themselves up to it with lyricism. They didn't want to understand reality. They wanted to idealize it. They got caught up in their fantasies and found it hard to distinguish their dreams from reality. Consumed and tormented by their passions, they paid a heavy debt to madness.
Adele Hugo, daughter of the greatest of romantics, born with a romantic soul, the victim of a self-fulfilling prophecy. With despair, Hugo watches his daughter sinking into the obscure world of madness. Once again, madness knocks at his door. courage, Adele runs away from her home and begins a ten-year journey around the world, following her English officer wherever he is stationed, New York, Halifax, and finally a small island in the Antilles. She is sustained by a meager allowance, which her mother forces Hugo to provide for her. Finally, after ten years, lived in the exile of insanity, she is brought back to France. The rest of her life until her death in 1875 is spent in an asylum. intellectual life is flourishing in the worldly salons. The wife of Napoleon III, the Empress Eugenie, sets the fashion. It is an era of prodigious talent of all kinds, but the conservatism and prudery of the middle class of the Second Empire remains intact where morals and morality are concerned. Art without rules is no longer art. It is like a woman with no clothes. Imposing laws of public decency upon art does not subdue it. It honors it. Gustave Flaubert's novel, Madame Bovary, becomes instantly notorious. Ce 29 janvier 1857, summoned before us are Monsieur Gustave Flaubert and Monsieur Laurent Pichard, author and publisher of the novel Madame Bovary charged with an outrageous breach of religious and public morals. In the case of Charles Baudelaire, the pictures he presents to the reader lead to the stimulation of the senses by a realism which is vulgar and offensive to decency. The court condemns him to a 300 franc fine. Victor Hugo, figurehead of romanticism, applauds the audacious and talented writers who are making themselves heard in France. My dear Baudelaire, your fleur du mal radiates and dazzles like stars. With all my might, I cry bravo to your vigorous spirit. You have received one of the most rare decorations that this government could bestow upon you. In Guernsey, Hugo works intensely. He owes his best work to his exile. La Légende des Siècles. Les Travailleurs de la Mer, and his masterpiece, Les Miserables. Victor Hugo was propelled to the head of the Romantic movement when he wrote the introduction to his play, Cromwell, in 1827. He was just 25. That introduction was a kind of Romantic manifesto which made him known. But his first great success came at 60 with Les Miserables. Some say the novel was hailed as the gospel of the 19th century because everybody understood it. Hugo would not have been insulted. He aimed at producing a popular literature, not just literature for the educated. In Les Miserables, 
he captured the thoughts and hopes, the confusion and sorrow of his age. Its huge success revealed that Romanticism was still very much alive. The exile of the most famous man in France was finally to come to an end with the fall of the Second Empire. A delirious welcome awaits him from the citizens of Paris. But this was not the beginning of an easy life for Hugo. The Franco-German War had begun in July. The Empire could not resist Bismarck's armies. Defeat followed defeat. On September the 2nd, the Emperor surrendered with 80,000 troops at Sedan. Napoleon III is taken as a prisoner to Germany. Two days later, the country in a state of total collapse, a new republic is proclaimed in Paris. Hugo again looks forward to an age of liberty and justice. The scaffold knocked down. More jobs. A feeling of well-being. Less talk and more freedom. The rich are happy and the poor less cursed. Free schools for everyone. Dreams, steamships, systems. We are still alive. We are all kings. But war doesn't end like that. Paris, besieged by Prussian troops, resists heroically. But the city was starving. Its citizens forced to slaughter the animals in the city's zoo for food. One more humiliation for a gastronomic people. On the 18th of March, 1871, Paris refuses the shameful capitulation that the provisional government tries to impose. The Parisians rebel and set up the commune, which would last less than two months, too little time to put into action their plans for social reform. These are days of anarchy. The painter Corbet hurls down the Vendôme column, symbol of the empire. Taking refuge in Versailles, the provisional government under Adolf Thiers desperately tries to gain control of the situation. The fire at the Tuileries begins the bloody week which savagely reduces the ranks of the communards. The repression from Versailles is without pity. After sham trials, the insurgents are immediately shot. The wound must be completely closed. The hatred must be wiped out. Monsieur, in the language of politics, neglect is called amnesty. I demand actual amnesty. I demand it fully and totally, without limits, without conditions. Through his writing, Hugo continued to live. But Adele was lost through madness, and Hugo suffered the deaths of both of his sons and Madame Hugo. Now his companions in life were the faithful Juliette Drouet 
and his two grandchildren, Jeanne and Georges. In a work of tenderness and love, he wrote The Art of Being a Grandfather. being kept in the dark closet with a lunch of dry bread. Punishment for some crime or other. And ignoring my duty, I went to see the little outlaw. And in the shadow, slipped her a pot of jam. Hugo watched a civilization grow up, and he recorded that as faithfully and as humanely as he recorded the beloved grandchild growing up. I do not bend the words in which I believe reason, progress, honor, loyalty, beauty. One does not reach the heart by taking a crooked road. Be just. That is how one serves the Republic. Duty means fairness, justice for all people, not anger. Anger cannot be just. The revolution is sovereign. The people are prodigious fighters who drag the past to the abyss, and with one kick, it is gone. Avenue de Lau is renamed Avenue Victor Hugo. His devoted fans can write to him, Monsieur Victor Hugo, in his avenue. The grand old man of the Republic has come to represent devotion to art, to politics, to social progress, to one's mistress, and not least, to oneself. He has not lost his romantic self. He has not lost his closeness to political events. He opposes the proposed peace between his country and Germany. I will not vote for this peace because, above all else, the honor of this country must be saved. Because a shameful peace is a terrible peace. Oh, the day will come, and we can feel it approaching. This overwhelming revenge when France shall have one idea, one thought, to be strong, to fortify herself. A France reborn, once again the Grand France, the France of 92. On this day, she will stand tall again, and we shall see her in one stroke. We take Lorraine, we take Alsace, conquer Mayence, Coblenz, Cologne, the entire right bank of the Rhine. And we shall hear France cry, Germany, here I am. Am I your enemy? No. I have taken everything back from you, but I shall return it to you on one condition. That from this moment on, we shall be one people, one nation. No more boundaries. The Rhine for all. Let us be the Continental Federation. Let us be the United States of Europe. On the 22nd of May, 1885, 83 years old, Victor Hugo dies. 
a funeral of unparalleled magnificence. The route from the Etoile to the Pantheon hung with crepe and lined with emblems of his works. A procession of two million mourners. And in the midst of all the splendor, in romantic simplicity, the coffin borne along on a pauper's wagon at the request of the dead poet. I refuse the oration of all churches. I ask a prayer of all souls. I believe in God. 